some things are better, better left unknown. And I'll never find you here, cause no one's ever, no one's ever Rabbit Hole is a community-driven radio. At times the community comments may reveal prejudices and other beliefs that we or our sponsors do not condone. Views or opinions expressed by the community, callers, or guests, are those of the individual speaking and do not represent the views or opinions of this site. Rippin' Common Sense content is intended for mature audiences only. Enjoy! This is My Life DIY and Hi, this is JoJo. Hi, my name is Ash. Hey everybody, it's AJ the Rippin' Rabbit. This is Cynthia Sue Larson. This is your man Meta, aka Propagate This Light. And you're now listening to Dark Wolf's Den. The Dark Wolf's Den Show on Rippin' Common Sense Radio. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. Are ghosts real? We had a thousand hours of continuous communication with the spirit world. 
does time travel actually exist? The laws of physics seem to be compatible with time machines. You know, sometimes I wonder about reincarnation, don't you? A four-year-old boy in Adelaide, Australia, has told his parents that he used to be Britain's Princess Diana. What would happen if the world found out that aliens were real? I didn't say disclosure would be easy, but what is the alternative? To establish a space force as the sixth branch of the armed forces. We have so many questions and yet so little time, so to have you here, the pleasure is all mine. Coming to you from a secret mountain cave hidden deep within the Idaho wilderness. This is the Dark Wolf's Den Show. Now, here is your host, Jerry Hicks. That's right, I am Jerry Hicks, also known as the Dark Wolf. And we are broadcasting live worldwide from a secret mountain cave hidden high up in the beautifully snow-covered peaks of the Idaho mountains. That's right. We're ripping through the electromagnetic soup, tearing through the atmosphere, and tunneling away into your radio like a quantum particle. This is the Dark Wolfstein Show for Thursday, March 25th, 2021. So whether you're on the edge of reality, the edge of the galaxy, or the edge of your seat, we're glad you chose us to be right there with you. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to finish out our investigative series on musicians and UFOs. And in each of the first two parts of the series, we touched on the concept of the downloads and the Mandela Effect people, I'm sure, might be extremely interested in this episode tonight because this is something we've discussed more than once in that community. And we're going to go in-depth on that tonight, Thursday, March 25th, 2021, on the Dark Wolf's Den Show. But first... Today in History... And keeping with our theme of musicians through the Today in History this week, we're going to round it out with this one, ladies and gentlemen, on this day in 1961. Elvis Presley performs live on the USS Arizona. And I always have to take my top hats off to the troops that are defending this country. And I love when I see different things like that. So that was on this day in 1961 ladies and gentlemen that is today's today in history and of course it's only fitting to have elvis presley not only because he's a musician and tonight we're talking about musicians and ufos but if you remember in the first episode of this series last thursday we spoke of elvis presley and his experiences directly with ufos so it's really fitting that we have his today in history for the last day of the series of musicians and ufos i just love when synchronicities like that work out it's absolutely awesome before we dig into the downloads tonight and uh the concept that we're going to be speaking about i'd like to give a real quick shout out to my buddy pete over the creepy little book youtube channel you guys may have heard him on the uh episode a couple weeks ago over here we sat down and had an amazing interview if you guys like what we do here may i suggest you go over to youtube and check out the creepy little book he's a paranormal researcher that really really knows his stuff like better than i do sometimes he is able to pull case files right from his own head that i i have to look up usually so uh definitely go over and check out the creepy little book on youtube uh my buddy pete give him a shout tell him jerry sent you from the dark wolf den show he will very much appreciate it shout out to you pete we really appreciate what you guys do over there and you know i, I love seeing fellow paranormal researchers so uh yeah i just wanted to give that quick shout out real quick before we get this show on the road Now, with that said, ladies and gentlemen, let's get this party started. That's right. Tonight, we are talking about a concept that the Mandela Effect community has talked about for about four or five years now, and that is the concept 
of the download. And the download's an interesting concept. So uh, we're going to look at this in the essence of an alien download, alien information downloading into the human brain. But I would actually argue that it's even deeper than that, that it's a conscious connection to the universe itself that is literally downloading information from the universe. And I think we all get a download from time to time for whatever reason. I don't know what the concept or the trigger that makes these downloads occur, but I think we all get a download, but I don't think we all install it. And I think that's what the Mandela effect is a lot is we're able to pull the information, but we don't, we don't install the information because when somebody suggests the Mandela effect to me, I can almost guess what it's changed into like almost perfectly every time like I can access the information but it didn't install I have the old information that I remember and that to me is the concept of the download well with that concept in mind let's go on and discuss what uh, Grant Cameron considers a download in this uh, conversation tonight so without any further ado ladies and gentlemen Mr. Grant Cameron so what happened was when I got the, the I started the book on the alien uh, rock stuff and it was just coming in and then I moved to, uh, when I started getting these alien downloads through experiencers, I changed it. I wrote this manuscript, and it's, it went to editing months ago. And it keeps, when you do a book on alien downloads and inspirations, you get downloads and inspirations, and you can never finish the book. It's like, oh, I've got to change this, I've got to change this. And so I do this, and I, I go through, like I go through modern music, downloads, inspirations through rock and roll, downloads through unpublished musicians, and James... Uh, um, Gillian was talking about the song that he has provided this actually on the charts in Australia right now. He got this download. And as we learned in the first two parts of the series, the songs that get downloaded to these artists, nine times out of ten end up being the ones that sell 50, 60, and 70 million, up to 100 million copies. I do inventions. I do Nobel Prizes. I go through eight Nobel Prizes that came in dreams or downloads where people are sitting on park benches. Now, I find that incredibly intriguing. The sitting on the park bench in the dream and getting the inspiration in that manner. And the reason I find that it very intriguing is there's been certain case files I've read uh, of near-death experiences where the experiencer has uh, went to this place that they described as almost like a park. And one of them specifically told me they sat on a park bench and talked to a uh, figure that everything the figure said made complete sense. Uh, they said they had the sense it was a male figure, but the point is, once again, you've got this setting on the park bench involved with this consciousness concept and this download of information. It's very intriguing. Uh, I go through scientific discoveries. I go through uh, books, music, art, savants, which is very important. I'll talk about that. Uh, psychics, uh, inventions, third man, aliens, ancients, uh, channeled entities, automatic writing, meditation, and basically what it comes down to is it's all the same stuff. It's all, as you'll see in my conscious lecture, basically, it's just, it's just the same stuff. It's just a different technique to get to there. Kind of like what I say with manifestation. So many different words mean the same thing. Prayer, manifestation, uh, meditation, law of attraction, they're all saying the same thing. They're just using different words for it. Same concept here. That you have the Atman equals Brahman, the small mind is links into the big mind, and if you can figure out how to get the password, your small mind can go up into the big mind, go onto the internet, download whatever you need to download, and that's and that's what they're doing. And of course, when it speaks of, or when Grant speaks of internet in this case, he means the internet of consciousness itself. Not the internet that we consider the digital internet through a computer, but literally downloading from the consciousness itself, the universal consciousness. So this is my concept is you have, you have, you have a sea of consciousness, you have a conscious mind, which you need to go in the physical world. It's a filter. It filters out all the consciousness, gives you just enough, enough consciousness to have survived in the physical world. And at some point, the filter gets ripped, it gets opened up, and stuff like this happens. <laughs> You, you get a download from the sea of consciousness. And here in a moment, we will explore a possible way to access this sea of consciousness just a little bit easier. One you guys may have heard of, especially in the music industry. And that's what I believe is going on. Here's one of the most dramatic. I do art, and these guys are a dime a dozen. There's piles of these guys around, but I show it because this is very dramatic. This is a guy who claims to be uh, channeling dead, 40 dead 
uh, artists. And they usually do this in the dark. He has his eyes closed, but they usually do it in the dark. Here's one guy doing two at the same time. This one, if you're a scientific, and I, when you hear my consciousness lecture, I'm not, I'm not very nice to the scientific world. Well, it sounds like Grant will fit right in around here on this show because we're not nice to the scientific world either. But let's be clear, we're very nice to real scientists. We're not nice to the scientism world that runs the scientific world, right? <laughs> but if you're scientific and you have doubts about this, you got to watch this video. This is actually a really incredible story, especially for those people that really do live in the uh, uh, logical minded side of things and if you guys are wondering what this has to do with music I promise this will tie in here in just a moment these two guys what the guy on the left is Fred Hoyle who should have won three three Nobel prizes except he believed he didn't believe in the random theory of evolution he said it was BS uh, it was like finding a 747 in the middle of a junkyard all put together and he also believed in panspermia. And then the editor of Nature magazine said, we've had it with Hoyle. We can't stand this guy. He's just wacko. And they basically cut him out of, he invented the, uh, the whole thing about supernova. And they gave the Nobel Prize to his assistant just to say, take that. Shut your mouth. This is the way science works. You, you do not back off. You do not do science. The other guy on the right hand did win Nobel Prize. It was, it was uh, Richard Feynman. Of course, Richard Feynman being well known for things like the Feynman diagram in mathematics and science and many many amazing scientific breakthroughs uh he actually had a lot of work in quantum theory back in the very beginning and they're talking about this thing that i'm talking about this download this sort of where the where the rip occurs and the conscious mind downloads something from the sort of universal metric matrix whatever you want to call it and what what Feynman is going to talk about is the supercooled helium theory. And they're talking about the moment of discovery. Now, you can remember these guys are both, like, uh, you know, very skeptical. They don't believe in the paranormal type stuff. But they talk about this moment of discovery. It's that moment of discovery. And you can see they talk about this certainty, this, like, absolute certainty. They, they knew what they got and was right. And it's funny because if you've ever experienced a download of information... And sometimes I have actually found myself with knowledge that I should not have had for whatever reason. Uh, but if you have ever experienced this download of information, it's it's not even a question like you say something and, well, is that right? Or uh, it's not something you've known or studied, understand. It's just something that, for whatever reason, you just happen to know. You never were experienced the information, uh, uh, exposed to the information, I should say. But you just know the information. It's not even questionable. You know it so well that it's 100% fact. And turns out that it's true. Well, where did that information come from? It come from the download. The download is so perfect in the, this aspect that it's 100% right. And what could actually cause the rift, the ability for the mind to get these downloads. What is something that a lot of musicians enjoy that would uh, open the mind up to these inspirations? We heard the one musician say that he was stoned when he wrote it. That uh, musician in the in part one, Lord help me, I don't remember which one it was that said it. But uh, with that as kind of a clue, what other you uh, thing do you think they use to open their mind to these inspirations of downloaded information? Uh, Feynman should have known about this because Feynman did LSD. If you take a look, and I say, uh, when I did the manuscript, I, I talk about downloads in computers and stuff. Um, all the money for computers was on the East Coast in MIT. All the computer stuff was invented in Menlo Park. Silicon Valley. And the difference was Silicon Valley had LSD. I absolutely assure you, I absolutely assure you, if it were not for LSD, you would not have computers. That's no joke. That might be an episode AJ needs to do one night, but that is no joke. LSD was instrumental in the creation of computer technology, according to the stories anyway. Even though we believe here that uh, computer technology and a lot of the components and aspects thereof came from the Roswell crash, but that's a whole nother story, right? You can look at the history, it's unbelievable. And I, 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 I go through the whole history, but they were using, back in, in Menlo Park, in, in the Silicon Valley area, they were actually using LSD before it became illegal to create things. Hewlett Packard was having engineering meetings where they would give people LSD and they would come up with these inventions. So 
Feynman was in that area. Feynman should have known, and Feynman did LSD. He never really admitted that it had anything to do with his discoveries. Here's the Nobel Prize. And amazingly enough, there's a lot of research going on right now into this very thing. The use of LSD in different uses like opening the mind up to uh, different collegiate academic ideas, uh, different scientists who are seriously using the uh, LSD to try to solve issues and think outside the box, or perhaps get a consciousness download from the universe. And now to the meat of uh, what we've been teasing pretty much all night. Now that we've got the concept of the download understood and uh, uh, the idea that all people, from scientists to musicians to everyone else, have this download. Let's discuss it in relation directly to musicians. And now we'll get into some downloads on musicians. I'll quickly go through this because we're running out of time. Here is uh, Bob Dylan talking about this creation of how uh, songs get downloaded to musicians. This is on 60 Minutes. Amongst musicians, this is like a well-known thing. It's not even a secret. Everybody knows about the concept of the download among the music world. But it doesn't necessarily have to be music, does it? We went over a moment ago, it's all people, but artists in general of all types tend to have this or this, this uh, download of information for their stuff, right? I wrote a book myself that was basically a download from the universe, a movie that I washed in my head and put on paper. Uh, maybe someday I'll be able to get that published. That's one of the many projects I'm working on. Uh, but with that said, uh, I'm not the only writer to have had experienced that. Wizard of Oz, instant download. Boom, like that. And we know the Wizard of Oz contains quite a few Mandela effects. We also know that the music industry and different lyrics specifically contain a lot of Mandela effects. And all of these circle around this concept of this download. Now that is interesting that all three of these concepts meet in the middle at download. Harry Potter. Here's J.K. Rawlings talking about all the Harry Potter books coming instantaneously after she woke up on a nap from a delayed train from Manchester into London. And at the time that J.K. Rowling wrote the Harry Potter series, she was literally flat broke and had absolutely nothing. And now she's got quite a bit from that series. This one, everybody uses Google. Google came in a dream. I would argue a dream of the CIA, but that's a whole nother story. Rolling Stones. Um, Michael Luckman was actually going to have a concert. Unfortunately, Michael Luckman just died. He was going to have a concert, a, a rock concert in Malibu. It was supposed to be this year or next year. They were negotiating. They were going to have it at Pepperdine University. Uh, he was planning to try to bring in the Stones. Uh, David Bowie, uh, uh, Merrill Fankhauser, a bunch of bands, and they were going to do like the Woodstock of the UFO, all these people who were clearly experiencers. And it would have changed the world, but unfortunately, uh, he died. So... However, I happen to know that there is a large variety of people that listen to this show across the board. So if you listen to this show, and if you are interested in uh, pulling this together, if you're a UFO experiencer and a musician, and you're interested in pulling this together and have the context to do something like that, May I suggest that you try to follow in the footsteps of this uh, this idea and try to pull together all the experiencers that are musicians for a Woodstock of ufology. That would be absolutely amazing. It's something I would love to go to. He, he was in contact with the Stones, and they had all sorts of UFO experiences and stuff like this. Uh, Stairway to Heaven, people will know that was probably the most famous song of all times. Stairway to Heaven was automatic writing. And we hear a lot of times from uh, channelers about the automatic writing, but not very often do we hear that coming from the music side, right? How many songs were automatically channeled through and written? It makes you wonder, huh? Uh, the, the lyrics came in automatic writing while they were, they had the, the song, but they didn't have the lyrics. And people get upset about it and they start bringing up the devil and drugs and stuff like that. So then I always have to bring the next one up. Oh, this is Katy, this is, uh, Katy Perry with her triangles. We'll skip this.
If you remember the first part of the series, episode one, we mentioned Ellie Goulding and her obsession with triangles and how a lot of UFO experiencers have this odd obsession with triangles, too. So when, when I mention Stairway to Heaven, people always say the thing about uh, uh, automatic writing is sort of evil. I always bring up the fact that the Battle Hymn of the Republic was also came through automatic writing in the middle of the night. And so did a little town of Bethlehem. So the, the, the devil's making all sorts of stuff. I bet the Christians don't like to talk about the fact that the little town of Bethlehem came through automatic writing, do they? That's something I bet you haven't heard before. <laughs> and I, I go through the whole thing about when, I, when, when they brought the devil thing up, I would say my mother was a church musician or a church organist for 40 years. So I said, well, let's go look at all the guys from the past. And it's like same thing, different day, you know, like same stuff. Mozart, they were all talking about downloads and they were just the scribe who was putting it on paper and stuff like this. And all of the, the ancient guys were doing so this is not a new concept by any means you it goes way back you find uh different like he said mozart and different artists from way back that still speak of this same concept of just being the vessel in which it goes through and once again i've had an experience like this where i've written stuff but my hand wrote it I was the experience, I was the vessel experiencing whatever this was from my, quote, muse, end quote. I got a download of information that had to go on paper. Like I spoke about in last night's episode, I've had those moments where I've just been uh, so overwhelmed by something that I had to write it down. It was a download of information from the universe, or at least I hope it's the universe. Yesterday by the Beatles came in a dream in the middle of the night. McCartney said the, the piano was there. He quickly got up and wrote the thing down. And of course, in at least one of the last two episodes, we've heard about the yellow notepad that most artists keep beside their bed just for those inspirational moments. He also had one that he had... Um, that he, he, he dreamt that he was playing with the Stones. And he woke up in the morning and he said, man, that was a good song the Stones play. And he went, I, they never played that song. And he quickly wrote the song down. He actually had a dream that he was playing it with the Stones. I wonder if that dream literally came true, right? If he ever did get the chance to play with the Stones, that specific song. I don't know because I don't know which song it was, but I'd love to know, like, if I ever could find that out. That'd be cool. The Guess Who, American Woman, the song American Woman. This is from my city. Now, this is a really, really strange uh, concept of creation for this song. If anybody's ever heard of the bootstrap paradox, this is about as close as it comes to the bootstrap paradox. Check this out. I haven't got time to tell a story, but in 68, Mississauga, Ontario, they played the song. There was a kid with, when cassette tape recorders first came out, was bootlegging the show. They grabbed the tape after and they played it after. Nobody remembered making the song, composing the song, playing the song. Nobody remembered anything. So where the hell did that song come from? And they had actually played it on stage. That's how American Woman came. So all of a sudden, everybody just started playing this beat and this song just kind of was born randomly out of the blue. I don't know. That's that's kind of extreme for me. Um, but nobody remembers composing, writing, making it or nothing. And if you've ever heard American Woman, that's a really good song. Especially one to be coming from who knows where that just appeared one day in the show, right? That's almost Mandela effect-ish, doesn't it? Sounds kind of weird. Francis Crick... Um plays the atheist thing and it's all random and stuff like that uh he did lsd and uh that's where the dna the idea for the dna molecule came from he was on lsd at the time and once again i really do think there's something to the concept of opening your mind up with these these psychedelic drugs and the thinking outside the box the ability to change the way the brain works in such a way or the consciousness itself works in such a way that you can access the universal consciousness and download if you will certain information if need be it could be that secret formula uh into the and it ain't necessarily got to be lsd uh, I'm, I'm sure there's a variety of psychedelics like psilocybin's a more natural psychedelic but it's again interesting that these psychedelics are this weird connection between that and the download. This is a really weird one. Uh, if Carrie Mullis here in California was going to his cottage in Northern California. Um, uh, he is the guy that invented uh, the reproduction of um, DNA, you know, for crime and stuff like that. He, he won the Nobel Prize, 1993 Nobel Prize 
for this, and he talks about the fact clearly that LSD helped him do it. He said it didn't give him the invention of this reproduction of DNA, but it did help him learn to walk around inside a molecule, and that's how he, he developed it. And once again, you have this ability to think outside the box using these uh, psychedelic drugs, these tools that are being used to access the extra ability of consciousness that we're not normally able to access. And perhaps it's in this extra area in which the concepts come to us of inspiration and things like that. Now, I didn't necessarily use any psychedelic drugs when my experiences did occur, uh, but just the same, I can totally comprehend how that could, uh, with the use of, that I have had in my life, uh, that, how that could definitely be a thing. But uh, we're going to go ahead and get the rest of this story in the second half of the Dark Wolf's Den show as the music is playing. You guys here, we've uh, got to go ahead and take a network break right here. The clock's got us, and we'll be right back for the second half of the Dark Wolf's Den show after these messages. Don't you touch that dial. That's right. we got to stoke the fires and run off the men in black. Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. Hi everyone, it's AJ the Rippin' Rabbit. Are you enjoying tonight's look at UFOs and Musicians Part 3? Can you believe it? Jerry Hicks and the Dark Wolf Den took you through three episodes on the subject. That's how deep the rabbit hole goes. If you're enjoying the program tonight and you haven't done so already, please make sure to thumb up that video. Hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. You'll get our notifications every time we go live. I'll be back again tomorrow night, Friday, March 26, 2021, as we dive through the rabbit hole of romance. That's right. I'm in the mood for love. Join me as we explore romance together tomorrow night, starting at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central. I got to tell you, it's going to be a fun show. And if we don't all have hearts on by the end of the broadcast tomorrow night something is wrong with all of us and then saturday march 27th storytelling let's look at the art of storytelling do you have a good family story do you have a story that's part of your legacy uh join us saturday night as we discuss storytelling because perhaps you are missing out on prime opportunities of ways to tell your favorite story. Then we'll end out the weekend right together Sunday, March 28th, starting at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central. All shows start at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central with an interesting look at the Rippin' Booth War. Explore the rabbit hole of Rippin's Booth War back in 18. 18- 54. We're going to take you back to a follow-up of last weekend with the Freedom Flame celebration and educate you on a little-known story, a little-known war that took place in Ripon, Wisconsin in 1854. Uh, it's going to be a great night to end out the weekend right together with you. Now, I have to apologize if I'm over-modulated tonight, but I can tell you, I woke up this morning with no hearing in my left ear. Like, I seriously, I can't hear anything. And unfortunately for you, uh, the left ear is the ear that I use for my headphones to gauge my sound and hear my own voice as I broadcast directly to you. I have no idea what I sound like right now. I could be totally overmodulated or I could be completely silent. What you deal with here at the Rip and Rabbit Hole. From time to time, we get it right though. We're here every Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights bringing you the very best of Common Sense Radio, the Rip and Rabbit Hole. We'll return back to Musicians and UFOs, Part 3 on the Dark Wolf Den Show. Hello. 
This is My Life DIY and Hi, this is Jojo. Hi, my name is Oz. Hey everybody, it's AJ the Rippin' Rabbit. This is Cynthia Sue Larson. This is your man Meta, aka Propagate This Light. And you're now listening to Dark Wolf's Den. The Dark Wolf's Den Show on Rippin' Common Sense Radio. If you were meant to be controlled, you would have come with a remote, but you didn't. And that's why you listen to the Dark Wolf's Den Show. Now, here is your host, Jerry Hicks. That's right, I am Jerry Hicks, also known as the Dark Wolf. And welcome back to the second half of the Dark Wolf's Den Show for Thursday, March 25th, 2021. So whether you're on the edge of reality, the edge of the galaxy, or the edge of your seat, we're glad you chose us to be right there with you. If you're just tuning in tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we are discussing Musicians and UFOs, part three of our investigative series. And in this part of the series, we are focusing on downloads, which is a concept, like I said in the first half, that has been very much talked about in the Mandela Effect community. And these are some guys that focus on this concept quite a bit. And it's something that I really uh, didn't even think about in the music uh, arena uh, but you find this in a lot from artists uh, to writers to scientists to, uh, as we learned in the first half, a variety of people who have claimed that their inspirations or their breakthroughs or Nobel Prize discoveries even have come from downloads from the universe or from an alien intelligence or from some other outside source and once again we're focusing mainly tonight on musicians but before we get back to musicians uh, we left off in the first half about a story about a scientist who discovered how to uh, recombine DNA for uh, for crime scene investigation. Well, this guy also was a UFO experiencer. Kerry Mullis. The strange part about him is he also has been abducted. And he's clearly a fact that he'd been abducted. He went to the cottage in Northern California, and he got there, and he, he put the groceries on the table, and he took his flashlight, and he was going to the outhouse, and he ran into the glowing raccoon. And the, <laughs> and the glowing raccoon said, Good evening, Dr. Mullis. And he said the next thing he knew, it was the middle of the morning, and he woke up, and he was just furious. He said, that little effer, I'm going to get him, and I hope he's still in the outhouse. I'm going to get him. And he went out with his gun, and he was going to shoot this thing. And then he, he was very upset with the whole thing. And then suddenly his daughter came, and she had three hours missing time, and she came to him, and she gave him the book communion, and she said, Dad, I think you should read this book. And once again, Whitley Strieber's communion. But the funny part of that story is it didn't even click that the glowing raccoon talking to him was completely out of place, right? He still went back to get this raccoon. It didn't even click that he had talked to the, or the raccoon had talked to him, right? <laughs> that's just, that's funny to me. <laughs> So here we got Nobel Prize winner, abductee. This is a download. This is the laser. This is Charles Towns. And this little bit of information, I still contend that the laser came as a back engineering project from uh, Roswell. Now, that's interesting that it has the Roswell connection because perhaps it could have very well been uh, an alien download, if you will, on how to reverse engineer this discovery in quote who actually asked the question where do good ideas come from really and he's sitting on a park bench they've actually made the park bench into a uh, as a statue that's where he got the download for the laser um, the, the hologram was another one that was download now I find that intriguing that the hologram uh, concept and technology was also a download here's my experience and then we're almost out of time uh, Colin Andrews I'm watching Colin Andrews. What happens, I believe, happens is I'm in the room. I really don't want to watch Colin Andrews. I'm not interested in crop circles. Colin Andrews is a big-time name, so I'll pay him respect. I'm going to go watch his lecture. I'm sitting in the room. I don't know how to meditate, but I'm sort of meditating. I'm just sort of sitting there, and what am I doing in this room? And I'm really not paying attention, and all of a sudden, kaboom, 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 kaboom all this stuff came into my head. Three things, and, and what happens is it's not that you're given anything for nothing. I put all this material together over 37 years, and then suddenly woke up and realized I'd been sleeping for 37 years. And all the stuff I'd gathered, but what happened, it was like the, the thing with the LSD where the scientists suddenly put this thing together. 
you move out of that state and something puts all this stuff together. So three things came into my head. One was a top secret memo that was written by the Canadians. 1950, the Canadians go to the Americans through classified channels, and they say to the Americans, what's going on with flying saucers? The letter comes back, they gather all this material through the military attache, through the Canadian Embassy in Washington, D.C. It comes back and they name all these things. And I talked about them, Stanton talks about them, flying saucers exist, it's the most highly classified subject, yada, yada, yada. As this download happens, and it all happens, boom, 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 like that, all three things, and the very next line of the document came in, the very next line of the document says, and we were also told by American officials that other things might be associated with the flying saucers, such as mental phenomena. And the Americans aren't doing very well because they said if the Canadians are working on it, they're willing to exchange credentials and talk to us. So 1950, the, the Americans tell the Canadians mental phenomena is part of the flying saucer situation. So mental phenomena is definitely, as we know from many case files we went over in the last year on this show, that it is definitely a part of the uh, alien scenarios, whether it be abduction or any kind of contact scenarios. There's always a telepathy aspect of it. We even discussed that in the Travis Walton case and the stare as he referenced it and we've heard that referenced many times in ufo case files where the telepathy is used and they kind of stare at the victim and are able to access their uh their minds and use telepathic communication and uh, all that stuff but this raises a good question listening to the time frame in which this occurred in which this memo is written this raises a question the key to that as i said from 47 to 52, there was nobody talking to aliens. Nobody was public. Maybe there was somebody talking, but it wasn't public. So how did the Americans know that telepathy was part of the UFO phenomena? Because Adamski and Williamson would not come forward till 1952, a couple days after the detonation of the hydrogen bomb, and Betty and Barney Hill would not appear till the 60s. So how did they know? There is one incident, 1947 falls right in line with the time frame that may very well explain why they knew there was a telepathic communication from the beginning. And I say now it's because we now basically acknowledge there probably was a live alien at Roswell. And when they picked up the craft, they picked up the live alien, and it was talking in their heads. And they went, holy. So that would definitely confirm Roswell if that be the case. That's how they would have known the uh, telepathic aspect of the aliens as far as uh, early, early on knowing it is because they experienced it from the first crash that they experienced in Roswell. That's how the Americans knew and told the Canadians in 1950 that mental phenomena was part of it, and they couldn't figure it out. So they start doing the LSD experiments, to, the CIA, all these people are trying to figure out how consciousness works. And we do know about Project Stargate, which we've discussed on here, and as well as the gateway experience process, which we've also talked about on here a couple times, which are both CIA projects to discover consciousness and the secrets of consciousness as well as project mk ultra to control consciousness but that was a whole nother side of it but the point is they got really really interested all of a sudden and that would definitely explain the sudden interest that they took into the subject they're trying to develop this because they know there's something very important and if we can control this you can go to the russian leader talk in his head tell him he's seen god and, and do all sorts of stuff and it, it always becomes a, a weapon and for those out there thinking that sounds disturbingly like what's described as Project Blue Beam, you are correct. I agree. That's exactly what that sounds like. So this is the first thing that popped into my head. The second thing that popped in my head was this guy. He's the former president of Penn State University. Uh, we chased this guy for eight years. He didn't want to talk about it. He, he admitted he was at a series, series of briefings, Wright Patterson Air Force Base, 1950, dealing with bodies and craft. And he said, I don't talk about this. I can't talk about this. Go study something else. Unless you have the mind of Einstein, you're wasting your time. You're never, you're up against the windmills. And he would just, and he, but he couldn't hang up the phone. So people keep phoning him and talking to him. A guy from Great Britain phones me. He says, he's talking about MJ-12. He says, Dr. Walker, MJ-12, are there still just 12 people on the committee? Or is there more than 12 people? Are they all still Americans? Or is this an international group? And this is the second thing that popped in my head. Walker, and I could never figure out what Walker, he would talk in rhymes and riddles. I never knew what he was talking about. And suddenly, I know what he's talking about. Walker turns to it. Walker says to him, let me ask you a question. What do you know about ESP? And the guy in Great Britain had no answer. So he said, look, unless you understand about ESP and how it works, you will not be taken in. He's talking about MJ-12, the control group. Unless you know about ESP and how it works, you will not be taken in. 
Very few people understand how it works. I go, that's what Walker was talking about. And if you remember the series we did in January on consciousness, I blatantly stated that I believe that ESP and these uh, other elements that are considered paranormal right now by science are actually very much fundamental elements of consciousness. If suddenly, and then the third thing, that was 1991 interview, 1993, Jan Hartson, as you know, Jan Hartson has an experience. Nine years old, he's in the backyard, 30 feet away from a flying saucer. He becomes obsessed with flying saucers. He becomes an electrical engineer. He wants to learn how propulsion of flying saucers works. He's at a UCLA, UCLA lecture to the engineering alumni Ben Rich, Lockheed Skunk Works, the head guy, is there, and he's giving the lecture. The last slide he shows is a flying saucer. He says, we know the technology to take E.T. home. And that is so very important. Ben Rich, Lockheed Skunk Works, the head guy, says, we've got the technology to take E.T. home. And that was decades ago. Jan Harson's there, Keller. There's a third researcher in the room, and they go, can you believe he said that? And so the, everybody laughs. Everybody thinks it's a big joke. A bunch of questions are asked. He said, we've discovered the mistake in the equation. We can now do it. It's not going to take a lifetime to do, but it's going to take an act of God to get this thing out of Congress because it's so deep black. So he goes through this. Jan Hartson's waiting. He's starting to head for the door. Jan Hartson is, he said, this is my chance. He goes running after Ben Rich as he's leaving the building. He says to him, Jan, I'm obsessed with this. Thing. I'm interested in propulsion. I need to know, Jan, how do they get here? How does the propulsion system work? Ben Rich looks at him. He says, let me ask you a question. What do you know about ESP? And, and Jan Hartson said, I didn't expect a question. I had no idea. So Jan Hartson, this is the key point to the whole thing. Jan Hartson says, well, that means everything in time and space is connected? And Ben Rich said, that's how it works. Gets in his car and drives away. This is an anecdotal story that I've heard a number of times from different researchers. That Ben Rich's final answer before snickering and getting in his car is, how does ESP work? And then when the guy says, well, all of time and space is connected, he says, exactly, and leaves. So it makes you wonder, what did Ben know? What did uh, he have access, uh, what information could he get that would tell him, uh, you know, what, the, how connected ESP is into the alien concept and the alien question? So this is the download I got, and suddenly I realized I've been sleeping. I've been chasing the president and the head scientist for the CIA and the Canadian government and stuff, and suddenly I realized, I was told, it's consciousness. The whole thing is consciousness. Look to ESP. Look to this consciousness thing. And once I did it, it was like, whoa, like as, as what J.K. Rowling said, it was like touch paper. It was like, whoo, suddenly everything started to make sense and everything started to come in. And I started to run into experiencers who were saying, oh, we're flying the craft. And I said, what do you mean you're flying the craft? And How do you fly a craft? They said, with your mind. And I'm like, wow. It's like, oh, this all started to put together. So. Um, and, and this is um, I just this is recent. Um, um, the FOIA material on F, uh, is still classified totally. Defense Intelligence Agency and the CIA all completely ESP. Nothing has been released. Nothing is releasable. It's all classified. Main difference between aliens and humans. Aliens are telepathic. This is the key. That's how they get here. That's how it works. They're telepathic. Once you understand telepathy and you understand how it works, you can do the magic that they're doing. They just know something we don't know. We're not telepathic. We don't understand that everything's connected. We think everything's random. We think everything's separate. It's me versus you. Survival of the fittest. Rape, pillage, and steal whatever you can. The world is not alive. It's just a resource. Use it up before somebody else steals it. That's our belief of independence, of, of uniqueness. We have to understand it's one. It's all together. Everything's connected. And that's what the aliens do. And you cannot get here unless you're telepathic. That's how they move. They don't fly here. They're able, like, like, like moving with the entangled particle, you're able to sort of move through space. So it all connects back with the alien question to telepathy and ESP, or the ability to send and download information from one brain to another. And perhaps that's the key. Perhaps we are being influenced, at least a good portion of the population, musicians and artists and things like that, are being influenced by alien downloads. Or perhaps it's universal downloads that has nothing to do with the aliens. Perhaps the aliens are getting the downloads too. We don't know. Perhaps the musicians 
are exactly uh, that, just bringing forward the messages given to them by the aliens, these ones that have been abducted. There are, have been a large number of abductions that we've talked about over this series, all of them being artists or people in positions that uh, would be using the inspiration more so than others, right? This has really been an intriguing series. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. But what do you think? Do you think that there are musicians that are being singled out and scientists and writers and certain ones that are being singled out with ideas because they're able to connect telepathically to different consciousnesses of aliens or whatnot? Or do you think it could be a universal consciousness that is coming through and uh, allowing people to access information from the universe itself? Or do you think it's just perhaps all in our heads? In the end, ladies and gentlemen, all you can do is look at the evidence, apply a little common sense, and in the end, you be the judge. We got to close it out. That's right. That's it for this episode of the Dark Wolf's Den show for Thursday, March 25th, 2021. Uh, so whether you're on the edge of reality, the edge of the galaxy, or the edge of your seat, we're glad you chose us to be right there with you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Den may be closing this evening, but don't you worry. The weekend fun is only just begun. That's right. Make sure you come out tomorrow. Friday, March 26, 2021, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central, where AJ the Rippin' Rabbit will be back with the Rippin' Rabbit Hole live show. That's right. On Friday, he's going to be talking about romance. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, it's springtime and romance is in the air. Tips and tricks are always nice, especially in that category. Make sure you tune in Friday for a conversation about romance. Definitely uh, do not want to miss conversation. All shows are do not want to miss conversations here on this network, right? Especially the one on Saturday, the 27th of March, 2021, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central. AJ comes back with an episode on storytelling. That's right. The Rippin' Rabbit Hole Live Show is going to be telling stories about storytelling. There we go. Uh, it's actually a very interesting art, an art that uh, both AJ and myself have uh, tried our best to conquer and make our, our uh, best art of. It's definitely something that you guys are going to enjoy. Storytelling is uh, uh, a true art, that uh, a gift that some have and some don't, but it can be learned. Definitely check out that episode Saturday, 27th of March, 2021, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central. Then on Sunday, 28th of March, 2021, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central. Make sure you check out AJ the Rippin' Rabbit as he brings back a historical uh, episode that he does every year. An episode that I enjoy very much called The Booth War. That's right. What happened in Wisconsin in the 1800s? What caused the Booth War? So much information, so much to go over, and so little time to get there. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure you come back Sunday, March 28th, 2021, as AJ the Rippin' Rabbit rounds out the weekend with the Rippin' Rabbit Hole live show here on Rippin' Common Sense Radio and RippinRabbitHole.com. Speaking of the RippinRabbitHole.com, ladies and gentlemen, make sure you hop over there and sign up for our backstage pass. It's going to allow you access to all the amazing uh, things we offer on the RippinRabbitHole.com. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, from the backstage lounge to the weekly email to the down the rabbit hole. That's right. And uh, that's where I'm going to go right now, ladies and gentlemen. So on behalf of Chick Mandela Effect, Walt House, Michael Musco, AJ the Rippin' Rabbit, and everybody at Rippin' Common Sense Radio, we thank you for being here. And remember, until next time, ladies and gentlemen, stay awake, but dare to dream. How? Yeah. Good night, everybody.
things are better, better left unknown. And I'll never find you here, cause no one's ever, no one's ever Fusion. 